Hello, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure and honor to be part of uh, that meeting. And hopefully next time we are going to be meeting face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some ideas and thoughts uh, about how to provide the best service uh, in aesthetic practice. I'm Ashraf Badawi. I am the president of the European Society of Cosmetic and Aesthetic Dermatology and the vice president of the European Society for Lasers and Energy-Based Devices a professor of dermatology at the National Institute of Laser Enhanced Sciences in Cairo University, and also a visiting uh, professor at the dermatology department at Szeged University in Hungary. And finally, I'm a laser consultant in Canada. Uh, so uh, when we talk about the uh, aesthetic surface, of course, I don't have any conflict of interest to declare regarding this talk. Uh, when we talk about the best service, it's very important to agree on the definition of best service. What is considered as best service? So this is uh, Rose McGowan, and uh, she has been undergoing several aesthetic procedures, and finally she ended up looking like this. And definitely who provided those aesthetic services, <coughs> excuse me, was believing that he is providing the best service. This is also uh, Sylvester Stallone. And after several procedures, this is how he was looking. It's not only the aging, uh, which he uh, underwent uh, uh, through, but also the aesthetic procedures which were given to him uh, maybe were not ideal, were not optimal. And finally, this is Goldie Horn. And after several procedures, this is how she was looking after several aesthetic procedures. So it's very important to realize that the goal of cosmetic procedures is patient satisfaction. And also it's known that patient satisfaction is achieved not only from a good aesthetic result, but also by meeting patients' psychological or psychosocial goals. Some psychological conditions, behavioral patterns, or life situations predisposed to dissatisfaction of the outcome, even if we did a technically appropriate procedure. So why psychological factors should be considered? Because patients look for more than improvement of physical appearance, because screening out patients who shouldn't have procedures can prevent frustration, and because combined psychological technique with cosmetic procedure could help. This is uh, Michael Jackson, we know, and he went through several phases of his life with several aesthetic procedures. And finally, this is how he ended looking. Was he happy with that or no? This is something else, but uh, many people can agree that he was looking uh, much better uh, in the beginning before doing any cosmetic procedures. So why patients um, look for cosmetic procedures? Uh, there might be external motivation, like interpersonal agendas, and uh, some people around those patients is having certain comments or uh, criticism or whatever, and also social agendas, which is becoming really very important now, as we have a lot of pressure uh, from the uh, social media and from the society for the perfect look, and sometimes the social media is uh, giving impression for people that they have uh, flawless uh, skin and everyone should be looking great. Uh, although in reality, many people who are the bloggers and uh, the people who are active on the social media, they are using filters and certain light uh, 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 um, effects and so on. So uh, in many cases, I try to convince my patients that their skin is much better than those people whom uh, she's looking up uh, to uh, without makeup. So this is the external motivations. Then we have internal motivations like long-standing feelings about deficiency or strong commitment to change. Those are factor of, factors from within which motivates the people to go for aesthetic or cosmetic procedures. And then finally, there are some psychological disorders which uh, push people in order to seek cosmetic procedures like depression, narcissists, perfectionists, and patients with this morphophobia. So this is an example of a patient who uh, were looking like that. And then she underwent 10 different cosmetic procedures. And this is how she was looking afterwards. Is she looking better or no? This is something we can debate. Did she need those procedures? Most probably not, but she underwent those procedures 
uh, thinking that she's going to be looking better. And actually, this is something which uh, looks to be funny, but it is true. Uh, this is the difference between men and women. Uh, women look at the mirror and they see everything going wrong. Men, they look at the mirror and they feel that everything is great. So this is a difference between men and women. And that's why when you have a female patient and she is addressing a problem, sometimes it is not that great. And this is something we need sincerely to address and let her what we can do and what we cannot do, what she needs to do and what she doesn't need to do. If this patient of this uh, lady came to you in order to uh, do a nose job for her, would you touch her when everything is perfect? Is this something you are going to entertain for that patient and do something to change her nose? This is a question which I'm raising and hopefully the answer uh, is going to be no, when something is not indicated, we don't do. Does cosmetic procedure produce psychological benefits? Yes, it can improve the self-esteem, it can improve the body image, and it can improve the quality of life. And no, if the patient is having depression, or if the patient is having an anxiety, or if it causes depersonalization. When patients are looking at the mirror, they cannot recognize themselves. This is called depersonalization and it is having a negative impact on those patients. Uh, communication is an integral part of the clinical practice. The demands of keeping abreast of the latest medical treatment approaches can overshadow the need to practice and improve communication skills. Yet communication is the foundation of all relationships, especially the healing relationships. The manner we communicate information is as important as the information being communicated. Our behaviors are measurable and modifiable. Some people are thinking that we are not good communicators and this is the end of the story. Actually, no, it is not the end of the story. When done well, proper communication produces a therapeutic effect for the patient as has been validated in controlled studies. This effect is a partial explanation for the powerful placebo effect seen in clinical trials. In clinical trials, sometimes we are amazed that the placebo medication is having some effect. And this happens because this patient who took the placebo thinking that it is drug was convinced that his doctor is giving him something which is going to make him improve. And he improves, although it's placebo, it is, it is not a medication. But this shows and demonstrates the impact of the psychological uh, factors uh, in the healing process. So how trust develops? Uh, when we hear words, then this is going to create interest and this is going to be compensated or uh, measured by our knowledge and experience. And this can go with our knowledge and experience. So it's yes, uh, or we feel no, this is against our knowledge and experience. So we don't believe that. But then there is another natural monitor, which is the emotions. And this is going to be created by how you say words, the tone, the rapidity, the hesitation, the poses, and also the empathic listening, how we dress, posture, the gait, gesture, hand movement, facial expression, eye movement, spacing. All those are going to be translated into emotions. And actually, we either trust or mistrust the person in front of us. So, and this trust or mistrust is true. Whatever I feel is something I'm going to believe. So that's why it is really very important to try to gain the trust and the confidence of our patients uh, in order to have a smooth journey in whatever procedure we are going to be performing. Uh, Non-effective communication includes excessive focus on medical questions, showing tension, anger, or nervousness, interruptions, withholding information or explanations, leaning back or angled away from the patient, unduly dominant approach and directive behaviors. What are the effective communications? Ensure personal interaction, not just transmission. Uh, it, uh, reduces the unnecessary uncertainty and it requires planning, thinking in terms of outcomes. And also it demonstrates dynamism. If we have a certain uh, plan, 
uh, we can be flexible enough to change the plan according to the dynamic situation we are facing. The impact of the empathic, uh, of the effective empathic communication, uh, uh, it can improve the compliance of the patient. So the patient is going to uh, trust what we request and the instructions we give them. So they are going to comply. Then uh, definitely if they comply to the instructions of the skincare before and after the procedure, then we are going to have better clinical outcomes. If they continue their treatment plan and the sessions required, they are going to have better clinical outcome for sure. And of course, reduction in cosmetologist shopping. And this is a common problem we are having. We most probably have patients who, travel, who visited some other clinics before, and they might visit other clinics afterwards. So if they are uh, confident and if, if they trust us, then this is going to decrease this co cosmetologist shopping. And of course, it's redu uh, reduction in the malpractice litigations because if they have expected complications, then they will know that it's going to happen and they are not surprised. Uh, if they trust the practitioner, then instead of going and filing a complaint, they are going to come back to discuss the issue and um, discuss how they can improve the situation and uh, um, cure whatever complication happened. What is the best service? It is understanding the patient's psychology. This is our role. It's very important to do that. Understanding the patient needs, using the best available procedure for the patient's condition and problems. So sometimes we are uh, experienced in certain procedure, in certain domain, but the patient needs something else. It's very important to direct the patient to the best place to have the service he requires. Uh, trying to achieve the desired results with the most natural result possible. And this is something which is really becoming important because during the past years, uh, uh, injectables were taking the upper hand. And in many cases, we are faced with patients who are looking very unnatural. So if there are other ways which can achieve rejuvenation, rejuvenation means restoration of the structure and the function of the skin, improve the quality of the skin and the different layers of the skin, restoring the uh, structure and function, then this might be uh, uh, giving the patient more natural uh, look and appearance. And today, patients are looking for that. The goal should be rejuvenation and not temporary fix or permanent damage of the tissue. So it's very important to understand our tools, to understand how to design a good rejuvenation plan in order to uh, get the patient a few years back uh, to how he's looking and how he's feeling. And this is something definitely we can uh, achieve with today's uh, tools of different procedures. Uh, if we design a good rejuvenation plan, uh, which is addressing the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous fat and tissue, plus any uh, problems the patient is having in his skin, then this is going to be considered a very good service. And this is going to be appreciated more with the patients. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll be very happy to receive any questions you might have. Thank you.